So welcome to the final uh, session for many of you. This has been like a marathon uh, for Ignite. Um, my name is Richard Harbridge. I'm going to be talking about building your intranets with Office 365. If you're a developer, um, this session might have some interesting uh, business level discussions and value propositions. I'm going to explain concepts, um, so that might help you. Uh, but it's not going to be you know, Visual Studio. I'm not going to open the SharePoint framework. I'm not going to do things like that. If you're an IT pro, um, I am going to talk about um, some, uh, again, of the, the changes that are going to happen. Uh, I may even talk about hybrid search. But again, I'm not going to break it all down and say, you know, here's how you would move your intranet to Office 365. You know, here's how you do content migration. Here's how you do this and that. So um, that's just to level set what we're talking about today is, is as much as I can cram in 45 minutes about why we would move to Office 365 for internet, and if we do it, what are the best practices and things that we should consider. Sound good? You guys rock. All right. So um, this is now my 10th, including expo and like community stuff that I've done this week uh, presenting. So my voice has made it. Um, I am super friendly, so if you haven't seen any of my other sessions or never seen me before, um, please, please, when I say I have business cards and phone numbers and, and contact information, reach out to me. I would love to have a longer conversation uh, than what we're having in this uh, sort of one me pushing to you uh, perspective. And in, at the same time, if you would like to, I would encourage us to have that conversation, at least if it's just some question and answer, in the Tech Community site. So if you go to techcommunities.microsoft.com, there's actually a sort of second screen experience to this uh, with the slide deck and everything else on there. It's great because if we have the conversation then, everyone else can benefit from it, even if it's months from now. So keep that in mind uh, as we kind of move forward. All right. So uh, I cannot cover everything I want to do in 45 minutes. So here's my excuse or my cheat. If you go online to office365intranets.com, we created a white paper. It's as, it's as comprehensive as you can make it without making it 100 pages. Uh, we'll put it that way. So it's about 70 plus pages. I think it's like 77 pages. And in it, you have everything around like authentication and how that's changing um, to some of the stuff I'm going to be talking about in this deck. So uh, if you want you know, a longer read or you want, I'm talking too fast, that's OK. Um, you also have this supportive resource. Um, and if there's stuff in here that you don't see, just let us know, and we'd be happy to uh, publish it. All right. So benefits of Office 365 intranets uh, and intranets in the cloud is the first thing we're going to talk about. And then we're going to basically spend most of the session talking about best practices, approaches, uh, things of that nature. So let's start with benefits of intranets in the cloud. Intranets in clouds, specifically SaaS solutions, et cetera, are more cost effective. That makes sense, right? Because we don't have to implement the infrastructure. We often have a, a payment model where instead of a big capital expenditure up front, we're paying over time. So that is something that's going to help us be more successful with intranets in the cloud. Um, another thing that's really interesting here, and I will state it, now that I know this is live streamed, I'm even a little bit more nervous about it, but there's actually uh, significant cost savings, not just in infrastructure, but in services effort, if, if you think about the labor hours. Um, that's both internal and with external consulting. So if you hire someone to do all this internet stuff for you, like the planning and the implementing and all that, you tend to find that it is about, brace yourselves, 40% cheaper to do it in the cloud, specifically when I talk about SharePoint intranets and SharePoint intranets online. And there's a variety of reasons for this. Obviously, there's services that you would do or labor hours that you do internally around infrastructure and figuring out the architecture and scaling those servers, which you may still have to do if, if hybrid search and other things are important to you, right? And if you're connecting the dots there. But if that's not a necessary piece, then that can reduce the price a lot. But it's also actually really relevant to point out that not all of the Office 365 experiences can be customized or should be customized. And so that actually reduces scope quite a bit because it allows us to have a conversation about how does it work, what's Microsoft doing in the intranet space that's really great that we want to embrace, and that reduces potentially us going and creating custom solutions in this area and that area and that area. And overall, the impact's about 40%. That number is based on our numbers internally when we do many intranets on both platforms, and it's also based on many, many conversations I've had with other industry leaders and people that run companies that do this. So a lot of it's consulting. I can only guess that it's probably similar for customers, so 40% cheaper. Another thing that's really interesting here is that the innovation benefits far outweigh the cost benefits. So even though there's tons of these cost benefits, oh my god, we all like money, right? And we can spend that money now on actually uh, adoption and helping users and improve their way they, they work. We can spend it on improving our overall digital workplace instead of just maybe the internet as a part of the digital workplace. So again, um, that's great. But this is really why intranets in Office 365 and the cloud are so compelling. Because when I move my intranet to Office 365, what that actually gives me is all of the innovation in the platform that's coming out, um, within reason, I can incorporate into my intranet. Um, and there's a variety of ways that we can actually do this. So think about it this way. If you go to the fast track, you know, the roadmap, uh, so fast track, Microsoft, 
dot com, I believe, or I think it may be, yeah, I think it was that slash roadmap. If you go to that uh, site and you type in the word intranets, you're not going to see a lot pop up. So keep in mind that this is a platform and they're building out capabilities. It's still up to you and all the people in this room to figure out how to rationalize those capabilities with how they're going to improve or impact our intranet. Does that make sense? So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about that. But this is the value proposition. This is what's so exciting about moving your internet to the cloud. One other point, who here is uh, from IT or at least has spent their, their they have war scars from IT? Yep, a lot of us, almost all of us. So we all know how painful it is to do technology upgrades. So naturally, one of the other things that's really notable is when we move an internet to the cloud, and this isn't necessarily just true for Office 365, but it certainly is true for Office 365. If we move our internet to the cloud, we never have to pay for that upgrade cost again. We do it once, and then really it's basically maintained inside that platform. The platform continues to evolve. Now, this doesn't mean that every year or two years or whatever your cycle is, that typically you relook at your internet and you rebrand re it, you do new design, you relook at the information architecture, the navigation. It doesn't mean that you don't have those costs. There's a tax we pay in our organizations every few years to optimize the knowledge and the structure and the internet and these types of things. We pay that every few years or hopefully every quarter or you know, shorter increments because that enables us to keep up with changes in the in industry and keep up with changes within our organizations, right? Because things change. So this navigation and this structure and these design paradigms may not make sense as both the platform evolves uh, and as we as an organization or an industry evolve. Make sense? So yes, this is awesome and tons of cost savings, but again, there's still a very strong need to have all of you, hopefully employed, continuing to Im improve and build on the internet. It just means you get to spend that money and energy again towards the design or towards these other improvements. So let's talk about best practices. Um, this is just gonna be uh, a big, long-winded uh, way of describing all the features uh, in Office 365 and how they relate to intranets. I tried my best to do this in a shorter session, so um, there's quite a bit here that we're gonna talk about. Now, we're gonna build this. You don't just have to understand everything in here. The slides are available both on SlideShare if you want. Also available, thank you Microsoft, you're so fast, already on the Ignite uh, website. They're also available on tech communities. Uh, so you got lots of places you can go get the slides. So totally cool if you guys taking pictures, especially if you're tweeting, but uh, don't worry if I go too fast. All right, so the first thing I wanna talk about is the sort of core foundational things in an intranet. So that's your information architecture, that's navigation and things like that. Um, have you guys, how many people in this room have used the new SharePoint uh, homepage? The new one specifically. A lot of us, right? So this is awesome. And the reason this page is great is because it's, in, it's like a site directory, right? But it's personalized for me. And it's not just a simplistic site directory that says, here's all the sites or places that you work, right? Internet sites and others uh, in this one nice roll up. But it's also really smart. So it knows which ones that I work in more frequently, et cetera. And if you notice this, it actually has this little activity feed. Super helpful because a lot of times when I think of the way I work and even site directories, I'm only using the site directory to get to the content. And this way I can actually see one quick link, get straight to the content. So this concept is both helpful here and helpful when we build our own site directories. So why would we build our own site directories? Well, this, first of all, this is really important, we want to embrace. So if your organization has discussed this, or, and I know many of these have, uh, and I have seen organizations even do this, where they say, we're not gonna have anyone use the SharePoint homepage, we're just gonna hide it, we're gonna customize the nav, we're gonna do all these hacks, don't do that, stop it, don't do that, right? Embrace it, this is good, there's nothing bad about it, there's lots of ways to manage this from change management if you're worried about that minor impact, and all of it is positive. And this complements sort of the traditional site directory that often we build in an internet, right? So that's kind of like the foundation have an internet, we create sites. And sometimes they're departmental sites and departmental portals, and sometimes they're team-based collaboration environments. It depends on what, you know, all of us have a different definition of what an internet is in our organization. And so what we want to do is we do want to have, you know, a site directory experience, uh, and we want to use this as well. And maybe your site directory experience can concepts like the graph and other things in this and actually improve your site directory experience so that it complements, again, not, not taking away from. Because remember, yours is going to be curated, probably, right, curated. This one is dynamic based on you as an individual. All right, so let me talk about that thing that drives the site directory experience in the first place. Um, if you look at new experiences for creating sites, Microsoft has made a wonderful uh, step forward. What they've done is they've added the ability to have confidentiality levels and things like that on sites. So this is a piece of metadata, right, a uh, piece of information architecture that really helps. There's this concept that's really popular in the industry that you should be using, which is this idea of location when I create a site, 
I ask for simple things. I ask you, you know, what's the division? What's the department, et cetera? And when you answer these questions, when I go and create the site based on that, I can actually set up what's called default metadata, right? A content type uh, value with a default column value of that item. So if I create an HR site, classified as HR when I'm creating the site or requesting the site or however you end up doing it, then what ends up happening is the site gets created and then a default value is set up not just in the document library but in the news and the calendar and everything else that's in the site that has a value of department equals HR. Why is this helpful? Because then later when I do search or when I do roll-ups or when I do a ton of other things, I can use that metadata. User never had to fill it out because they're, they're just going to where they would work, they're putting their stuff there, and now we have all the richness of metadata. So that's a really simple concept, but to do what I just described, if you were to do it manually with this, because this doesn't have those properties, it would be really painful. So are you guys ready? The first customization I highly encourage you to do is to build site provisioning. So this is a customization. If you're a developer, you're like, yay, something I can do, right? Um, so this is something you should do. Every organization that's a, a certain size, again, it's not like you can't use this, Right? If this is good enough for you, or if you don't have that many sites being requested, you can definitely, especially for the internet sites, you can kind of PowerShell it or do other techniques. But when you start to get to scale, you need this. And that's really helpful because the provisioning process doesn't just allow for people to fill out profile properties or whatever that you want for a site or a group or a group site. Um, but it also actually enables you to do other things. Uh, and again, visually, this can show up in a variety of ways. We can use the modern SharePoint framework. We can use mod uh, modal dialogues. I don't care how you do it. I'm just saying it's a good exercise to do. When we do this, um, what happens is when we create the sites, not only can we apply, say, these, um, these pits of metadata, but in many cases we actually want to define the home page of the site. So when you create a new site of this type or this department uh, template or whatever it is, we need these web parts in this order. Maybe we want the Yammer feed in there, and so Yammer's not there by default, right? So we have to use code or something to actually inject or add and configure all these components. So again, this is great because the more you control you have over this, this is one of the reasons I, again, this is tricky because there are wonderful third-party vendors in the expo hall, but I think sometimes it's good to build it yourself because then you can actually add in some of those other components, right? So I'll dance that line a little bit more, and if you want to talk more about it, we can after. Um, all right, so site provisioning, awesome idea, helps in a variety of ways, good customization. Um, something you shouldn't customize, is, and we talked about this briefly when I said don't get rid of the SharePoint uh, homepage, here's another one, don't touch this. Did, did anyone, has anyone seen this uh, customized like a million times? And here's, I'll give you the top reason why. Seriously, this is the top reason why. Someone says, okay, I really want the logo on the, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sorry for the, the fake sound, but I'm worried about the logo, I really want it on the top left, if we have it on top left, that's gonna look a lot nicer, and so we move it to the top left. But then, they go to Delve Profiles, they go to Outlook uh, on the web, they go to any of these other places, groups, and you see it all of a sudden move around, right? The logo is moving around. So that's a terrible idea, and you can just tell them, Richard says it's a terrible idea, I'm not saying it, it's him, right? <laughs> And then, and then some people say, oh, but I really like this app launcher thing, and I want, I, I, I want to use only part of it, so let's hide it. So we hide a bunch of the tiles. Stop it. Don't do that, right? Because, in fact, you can actually, uh, there's configuration values and things you can do to manage what's in the app launcher, but you don't want to change it because it's getting updated. Here's an example of the update, right? Um, I'll zoom in in a second once this refreshes. So when you think of the new app launcher, this also brings up another question. One of the most on intranets tends to be this sort of quick access or apps, right? The, the, the many apps and, and things within our environment, especially if you think of an intranet as a portal. So here, in a second, once it loads up, I'm just gonna zoom in so it freezes it. If you look at the new app launcher, um, and of course the old app launcher did some of this as well, but if you look at the new app launcher, again, we don't wanna customize this. What we can do is we can actually create our own tiles. And when we create our own apps or tiles or however you want to frame it, these can be single sign-on experiences. If you have Azure Active Directory Premium, right? So you can have single sign-on, it's great. Um, but you also can add them and they show up under new or all, right? So I add a new app, let's say for the internet. That's a common app that I might add so people can quickly get back to it. Um, other things like the URL, click uh, do it. But let's do that. And now what we're doing is saying, and here's the trick, users can't, you can't today, uh, it's not on, uh, an available feature, you can't necessarily push that app to every user, but the users can add that app. You guys with me? That's the state of it. So if you have a need, a real need, 
This is really critical because we know how successful our app launcher has been in the past, or that's one of the main reasons, we, it's one of the features we really like, or uh, executive or leader really likes it. If that's really important to you, then okay, build your own app launcher. Build your, uh, not Complement it with this, still use this, don't hide this, but then have your own sort of internet app launcher, right? That you can have things like push these apps to users and things like that. I know it's a little bit confusing because you have the two, but you shouldn't hide this because there will be more features and improvements like uh, the documents that you work on, et cetera, starting to show up there. Um, so again, just to give a quick recap, there are ways you can do it today. Try and use what's out of the box first before building something new that's, one, a bit redundant, two, may actually satisfy all your needs. All right. Uh, another example here is analytics. So um, how many people have seen the Power BI content pack for Office 365? Just a, a good number of you, actually. All right. So yay, we finally know it is coming soon, and that is huge. So what I'm going to talk about briefly is that generally speaking, in intranets in Office 365, Office 365 has so many auditing capabilities, they have so many actions that they capture, not just in the intranet but across the suite, that you actually have more data than you know what to do with. It's incredible. So if you're thinking, do we have the ability to report on all the things we want to report on in a traditional Yes is the definitive answer. There's no question. There's nothing you cannot report on uh, with that. Now, do I have the reporting that I want to have, and is it kind of pre-built for me, and can I share it easily with users? That's a separate question. So if you want to distribute reports to users, then maybe you like some of the pre-built reports that take all this wonderful data that a third party and you might look at the third party for uh, some of these internet reports on Office 365. Another thing that you could consider is you could build them yourself using Power BI or kind of building off of the content pack of uh, Power BI. So there's lots of opportunity here for you to build your own type of report. I'll give you an example of something that's not available out of the box and that you would have to figure out. There's third party products and you can even customize and do this. Where let's say I wanted to know not just how many people visited this page or interacted with this object, but I wanted to see inside that page where people clicked. And we wanted to kind of track the user journey or do things like that. If that's a need for you, you have to go third party or you have to build that yourself. But everything else, more or less from a data perspective, 100% cap, including even the, the interactions around documents. In fact, what Microsoft is, oh, sorry. So quick note here. Um, there's always a lot of questions about what data is reported on and what are the different reports and metrics inside of Office 365. So there's the Office 365 Internet's white paper. We also uh, did this finally last week. Um, it's the metrics white paper. I think it's like 30 pages, and it breaks down all the documentation for like you know what reporting is available and how you would use it uh, in a variety of circumstances. The metrics or the Internet white paper also has some around metrics, but not as exhaustive in terms of capability. And soon we'll add the Power BI content pack and all sorts of other cool guidance in there. Um, so this is, this is one of the key points I want to make. There's experiences that Microsoft is doing um, that make tons of sense in team environments that also really help inside of publishing or communication-based environments like an intranet. And here's one of the ones I really like. So this may upset some people, but I think it's important. Every single site in SharePoint, right, that we're building our intranets on, has this site contents page. And when you go to the site contents page, every user can see views in the last days and the trending information. Why do I like this? Because I have argued with people forever to try and put like a little last modified or something else on those departmental pages and things like that to show either how out of date they are or how non-dynamic they are, or, you know, et cetera. So no one wants to do that. It's a terrible UI decision. But here what we have is something slightly hidden, right, but it, that is visible and available for any user if they want to click that site contents option. And I think that's a positive trend because what it's saying is this information is useful to users. But more importantly than this, on the right-hand side, you can see trending content. So all content, remember all this data is captured, all content also has trending, popular, what's popular, what's not. It used to be expensive to build something like a what's popular widget. Super easy now, right? They're either pre-built for you inside of site contents and things like that if you're uh, doing that, or you can just use a content search web part, or you can use other techniques like the graph to roll up that content. So this is a much, much easier thing, and because the data is there, of ways we can actually add data, add insights into our internet experiences and improve the experience because of that. So something to consider. Um, and then just to give some context, even if you have an internet author or owner, think of how they might be able to see reporting on theirs without, again, requesting from the internet team or you having to take on new scope for reporting and other things because they have these tools available to them. Um, and there's more coming in this space, obviously, as Microsoft uh, determines the right UI experiences. So again, these are the benefits of the internet and the cloud, right? We're getting these innovations as they come. Another really interesting uh, thing to talk about is search. So um, there's basically, so search in 
intranets, um, there's two key points here. If your intranet is in Office 365, but you have team sites or you have uh, document management systems or you have other things on-prem, then you're probably going to consider hybrid search because we want one of the big compelling things for an intranet is a unified search, right? One place to search, etc. So if that's an ambitious goal that you have, then you might have some other prerequisites in this case of the SharePoint server deployment, you know, setting up a hybrid search so it's indexing. You can actually have a 2013 environment that can do all this. Uh, with the cloud search service application. And it's good because you're not paying for a lot of extra index servers because that's actually mainly being done by the cloud. Um, so there's a lot of uh, cost reduction. But that might be one of the things from a technical perspective you need to consider. That said, once it's done or once you consider that, or maybe everything's in Office 365 so it doesn't matter, then what you have is a beautiful rich search experience. And the place where we customize search is still these SharePoint search pages today, right? So if I want to have this really rich search, not just for content, but maybe for people, as an example, let's say uh, out of the box you can see there I have skills and interests and stuff like that, but let's say I want to see um, a common thing in law firms as an example is I want to see where the person sits, right? The office location, the little map, right? Um, floor plan. So you could actually have that show up there. So you're customizing it, but this is a place I'm okay with customization, right? Because it's supported, it makes sense. The thing to understand is there's something you don't customize. Um, an example, let me step two ahead, is the profile. So if I actually go to the profile experience inside of Delve, what you see is that it's improving. Uh, this week they announced a bunch of improvements to the profile. Some of the things I'll call your attention to is the fact that the profile itself, the information about the person, is less important than all the stuff around the person, right? And this, this, is, this is a positive thing. So this is the first challenge. If we're moving our internet to Office 365 and we believe that this is better, and that not just this but LinkedIn, hint, hint, and other things in the future are better, then we want to embrace this new profile model, right? And so in that case, then we don't need to customize them anymore and we can just accept that these are the way the profiles work. We can still have experiences in a variety of places where we can change, you know, maybe for expertise search or other things and still do some things with profiles in search, let's say, but we wouldn't change that. Here's another reason why, even if you could hack it, and there are crazy ways you could, even if you could somehow customize the profiles, you shouldn't because there's things like the new people card. And the people card experience actually uses a lot of those profile concepts inside the card. So wherever I see a person, Throughout all of Office 365, not just the intranet, I can see this people card and so on and so forth. So you guys get the idea? So customize, search, okay. Customize, profile, not okay. Um, and so we have to accept that. So that's hard. So the quick answer for that, um, for those who have to communicate this to leadership or other people, is take the time to actually create a bit of a flow, take some screenshots and walk them through. And so whenever you do your design for your intranet, then guide them to how it's gonna look well and work well with the Dell profile. The good news here, if you're incorporating the sweet bar in your designs anyways, there is at least some consistency in the design as you move across these things. So one other point here um, that I wanted to make is uh, another customization that's really popular for both uh, people search and this is to actually create your own search experiences specifically in the internet. So however you do this, I'm using one example here, simple one. So maybe I have a navigation and then in the navigation itself, it's Again, these are design decisions, it's up to you. In the navigation, maybe I have this search and I can do something called type ahead search. So as I start to type, it starts to show me results. Now you could customize this however you want. Right now it's really basic. You could have these be icons that are different for different things. You could have you know, rich information. You could have dynamic panels. You could do all sorts of things. The point here is that this exercise of basically doing this type ahead search is really, 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 really simple code. It's actually already there. The platform does it when you go do a search inside of a SharePoint site, when you do a search in a lot of other places. It already does that. So all we're doing is saying, hey, if there's capabilities like that where we have this type ahead as search preview, we should make sure we incorporate that into our design when we build out these other pages. You know, so if you have a people search that's separate because you really want people to engage with expertise search, and that's really important to you, so you have almost like two search boxes, that's okay because it doesn't have to be the more typical two search boxes. You can actually have the people search be more dynamic where underneath it it says things like, you know, people that more recently were praised or whatever it is, right? Whatever makes sense for your organization. These are the new hires and there's lots of ways to dynamically figure this stuff out based on things like the hire date, which maybe you sync into the profile data, which then we render up in the search result underneath that. Does it make sense? So the, there's lots of really cool ways that you can customize search. 100% behind all of these customizations because again, they're in an experience perspective, they're a design decision and they're gonna complement or improve the user experience. They're not gonna create more confusion because the users can still use the traditional search patterns that exist in Office 365. All right, we talked about a lot so far. Let's talk about news. Um, so news, uh, there is a new, uh, you, there's, 
in the industry, there's a current trend where we have a lot of hero images. So this is like a trend, right? So in, the, in a lot of our news articles now on public websites and other things, we have a sort of a hero image at the top. And then under, on top of the hero image, we have like text and things like that, um, information. So it doesn't have to look like this, but you guys get the idea. What I would suggest is because that's the direction Microsoft has taken team news and other locations, we should use that as a baseline for our discussions around design. We want to have a bit of design consistency, right, so that users aren't going to go, oh, this is very different. So I would encourage the hero image concept, and I would encourage a singular layout, a singular column layout for news, not having stuff on the right, et cetera. The reason I'm encouraging both of those models is because it's way easier for responsive design. Two, as you switch this over to the SharePoint framework and other things, it's going to be much easier. Um, and then three, um, there's lots of new UI models. Uh, again, I, I guess I shouldn't get into this design stuff too much because my uh, other people are better at it than I am. But like as an example, you could have a thing that pops up on the right and it says like, like little tabs, sliders. Like there's lots of ways to give people navigation or other things that you'd commonly put in a two column layout, but that actually is responsive and works across mobile devices. So I'm not saying don't create your own news and customize it. A great example of this is when you um, create news, you might want to have Yammer for all your comments. And so you don't want to have to have it so that every person who creates a news article has to go and embed a Yammer feed and then point to the object, which is the news article. You know, this, this is a painful process, right? So you can actually do that whole thing that I just described with a little bit of code. And we can do that because remember, when we provisioned uh, all these sites, we also are customizing it there. So why not take a step further and make sure that we create the news in a way that allows for you know, the automatic add of, say, Yammer comp something like that into the news flow. Um, I'll use a different example a little bit later on that. Um, this is an example of the new uh, team news experience. So um, I briefly mentioned this earlier, but uh, this is being recorded and also being streamed, so let me reframe it. Basically, what we have is a trend in organizations where we have news that is personalized, right? And it's now it's um, sort of targeted, audience targeted. Now it's becoming hyper-personalized, which makes sense. So in an organization, we have organizational news, we have departmental or divisional news, and then we also have team news. And team news is different than some of these other ones. Typically up here, it's very communication focused, right? I'm sending a message, maybe I have some commenting, but it's not, it's not like really rich stuff that's gonna make sense for that individual. Often it's to announce things or to provide uh, commonality and uh, understanding and communicate core concepts. Here what's happening is people are working on a daily basis. This is the vision of this. And what they're doing is they're taking a summary of kind of key ideas and concepts and work progress like a work report, et cetera, and they're putting it into a news item. And that's really great because that means you don't have to go and look at all of these libraries and lists and documents that might have been updated because someone might be providing almost like a status update that says here's where we're at, right? The status update would be a great example of using the team site news. So that content, as you think about it, is really helpful into your design for your news on your internet. So I encourage you to think about the modeling now for a moment. If our news is very different and we're not thinking and we're not experimenting and understanding the new SharePoint framework and some of these other things, then we're missing an opportunity to make the internet experience not just have the corporate news, but to potentially have hyper-personalized um, uh, hyper based on you know, where people work and the stuff that they do. So that's really interesting. That changes the design. It changes the design language, right? Because we need to have maybe better color coding or some other mechanism to help differentiate that. We might need to have different placement on the internet homepage and stuff like that for it. But again, a really interesting opportunity. The whole point really here is that um, the, the platform SharePoint, I mean, a lot of uh, award-winning internets, pretty much all of them, are built on SharePoint. And so these award-winning internets all have something consistent. They all have news. And all of the news, in most cases, is built with content types, page content types, things like that. And we render up the content from those pages into you know, a search web part or through REST APIs onto a home page. So again, the pattern state remains the same. Nothing's changed. What's changed is we have to understand these new capabilities, and we need to in involve it both from a design and from a development understanding perspective. Um, all right, so here's another example from mobile experiences. Um, there is a wonderful, wonderful uh, SharePoint mobile app now. And the SharePoint mobile app uh, is really, so let me take a step back. The question I often get is, should we build a intranet mobile app, right? We want to have an intranet, and we have a responsive, every intranet should be responsive design. Hang on, I think I have a slide for that, let me make sure. Uh, every intranet should be responsively designed, right? 100%, everyone's agreed in the room. Does anyone disagree with this? I'm going to call you out. All right, no. We all agree, right? Intranets should be responsive. It's so cheap. There's tons of examples. There's GitHub repositories that have uh, examples of this. Super easy if you're a developer, no problem. Um, so we have that. 
Uh, at the same time, uh, besides responsive design, what it, we might want is a mobile-based experience for the internet or for internet services, so aspects of the internet. So my encouragement here is to understand what Microsoft has and what they're building for these mobile platforms between Delve, the SharePoint app, et cetera. And then once you understand what they're doing, ask yourself how much overlap is there and is there a value in having the overlap? In many cases, uh, you may want your own news roll up. You might want a corporate news app. But you could have an option, uh, in my previous talk in this morning, I talked about this, you can have an option where you click on a, a link or a button and in the button, maybe it says like Team News or something. And when you click on that, it switches to the SharePoint News experience, the SharePoint app. Does that make sense? Until Microsoft eventually gets corporate news and other things inside of these wonderful experiences. So for today, to manage this, this sort of difference, you could just have a, a, an investment into a corporate news app, et cetera. And then you could have a link or app-to-app -app linking or app switching, right, where I switch now to the SharePoint app. So we can integrate them, right, just in a pseudo way, right, with the, the linking. You can't change their app, but you can change yours, so it points to it. So working your way backwards, yeah, that's a bit hard, but otherwise we're good. Another interesting thing about this is that um, there's a couple of ways to do people search, right? You can do people search inside of the SharePoint app. You can do people search inside of the Delve app. Now, many organizations may not be satisfied with the people search here. So I would say if you have unique people search needs, then maybe you build an app. Let me show you for a moment, because I, I meant to talk about this with profiles. If you look at a Delve profile right now, and I look at the profile, I said you can't customize this, right? But what you can do is you can absolutely add properties to the profile. So here I have an example of LinkedIn, of um, having you know, my practice group or something like that internally. Uh, I have a person example, which is a clickable link that goes to the person. Maybe uh, soon we'll have actually the, the people you know, tab or the, the call out that, that pops up. So you guys get the idea. You can still do some of this, but understand when the, where this shows up and where it doesn't. Um, so as if I do the same thing and I open up the Delve app on Windows 10, which I won't do just for saving time, then those properties that I have there aren't showing up. So just, just understand the, you know, the current state and the future state of what they're doing um, and understand that, yes, you can add those properties. You can even sync the properties. So there's lots of techniques for this. Some of them are a bit painful for now, but will improve. Um, and again, for people search, maybe that's good enough. But if it's not, then maybe this is a great app experience you can build, especially if you have people that aren't in Office 365, but that are partners or contractors or other people that wouldn't have licensing or wouldn't have Office 365 accounts for a variety of reasons, and whatever reason you wouldn't sync them to Office 365. Again, there's lots of very specific reasons that a personalized or specialized people search app might make sense. But what I'm describing here is kind of different um, experiences, right? App experiences. So when you look at all of this and take a step back from an industry perspective, an intranet is really meant to do a lot of these things, but now if everyone's using their mobile devices, maybe we should really think about all those intranet type services and whether or not we want to start building more and more for that. And there's techniques for this. There's even uh, power apps and other things that can potentially simplify this. All right. So that's my quick point on the intranets. Uh, and there we go. And so uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about uh, briefly is the social. Um, so I've picked social to focus on. Um, shared stories is a really good point. So if you think about a very common pattern, if you're not doing this, consider it. Uh, in your internet, when you have a news section and a news roll up, consider adding just like a submit a story option or something that allows people to share stories at the corporate level. Even if they could do news or something at a departmental level or something like that, allow them to do that. In fact, often what we end up doing is when you departmental news uh, models, you can actually add it so that when they create a post for the departmental news, they can actually say um, potentially or would submit to share on the home page, et cetera, and that sets a metadata property, kicks off a workflow, whatever it is that you want to do, and then that potentially shows it on the home page. So they can kind of determine, curate, whether or not they want it to be on the overall corporate news, whether it's really, you know, it's really just for those who go, kind of go to the subsite or this other location-based news scenario. Um, so another thing to consider here is how social gets integrated into an intranet experience. Now, I'm not saying you have to use uh, something like uh, Yammer for your social feed, but obviously uh, we, we are a Yammer partner. We love Yammer. And we have some third-party products that we work with that kind of replace or complement Yammer. So when you look at your intranet, what you want to do is uh, you want to make sure when you do slap a social feed on, wherever the social feed is coming from, that it's not an all-company feed or it's not an uncurated, unfiltered feed because that's just going to distract everyone from the internet experience. And that's what often 
They just say, oh, we'll just add social. We'll just add it. We'll just toss it on the page. And that's a bad idea. So an example with Yammer, if we pick on that specifically, you can actually make it so that the Yammer feed that shows up on the home page is actually showing based on um, a topic or hashtag. So think about this for a moment. You can actually basically create a self-curation model where people say, let's say the internet name is um, you know, my, my internet. I type, uh, type in a post or I share something and I can actually hashtag it or use the topic of my intranet and now it's going to show up on the intranet homepage. This means that the majority of content here at least is meant to be there, right? There's, there's a reason, a purpose that someone's sharing it there. And so that's really interesting because it's a better model than just having, well, let's slap that on. You could also consider following and other feeds. I'm not against those. I'm just saying at least have a discussion about it and decide how you want to incorporate social. And now this is just for this page. Maybe you consider groups uh, as a target for some of the other pages or because we have the group site and we have sort of the publishing site and so maybe we combine those. Um, so there's lots of other things to consider here too. We work through departmental portals and things like that, but it still follows the same basic process. What should this embed be? Should the embed be pointing at a topic, hashtag? Should it be pointing at a group? Should it be pointing at something like following feed, et cetera? So at least think that through. And then here's the magic, because we've already created a site provisioning process. If we do use Yammer, by the way, it's super easy because we can actually have it so it's auto-configuring all these Yammer things. If it's a brand new site and we provision it, we could even, even without the group's integration, we can actually go and provision a Yammer group. We can associate the two. And of course, hopefully, uh, you're going to use the new group's model to manage membership across the two of them. Right? So you can actually have really rich social uh, engagement on your intranets to create dynamic content within pages, um, and that's one way. Another interesting thing to think about is if you have good activity and experiences going on in Yammer, maybe there's ways to surface that in the internet in other ways besides just the news feed. So as an example, there's, you can call the Yammer API. There's things that you can do. So imagine for a moment I actually look at either by exporting or doing other I look at the data for who praised who, and then I might actually show you know, random ones or you know, the, the person who received the most praises or whatever, whatever you want to in a variety of different internet experiences. Um, you know, maybe in the HR departmental page, I have this whole thing about how we recognize one another, and then it shows like you know the last ten people that were recognized, and you know little blurbs, and they can go find out more, um, et cetera, et cetera. All right, you guys get the idea. Um, one other thing that comes up sometimes with uh, these other platforms as we integrate them, it doesn't have to be just be social, but sometimes other platforms have competing functionality. Um, so just understand when we say we need a poll, do we need a poll because it's it's a communication-based poll that we really want to roll out, and that's a feature, or do we? Or maybe this would be sufficient right, uh, to have you the Yammer polls and be able to post those Yammer polls and then have people from a, because polls tend to have a lot of responses, they tend to stay at near the top. It's not curated. We can't guarantee it. Um, there's also some interesting kind of hacks where you can actually point to a specific Yammer poll and show that on a page. But uh, now we're getting into very specific customization. I've already mentioned you know, for news how to maybe add the Yammer feed below that. All right. Um, Another key point here is uh, that there are other experiences coming that may have an impact on this. So my caution here is if you're thinking one of the big things we're going to build in our intranet is uh, praise and kudos and things like that, consider at least Microsoft's uh, building in praise and what will eventually be rolling out and understand what's in Yammer or other technologies so that you're not building something redundant or if those are sufficient, you're not you know, wasting that energy and exercise. Um, there's still reasons you might create your own uh, regardless, um, and that's okay as well. So uh, just to give a quick summary, we talked about almost everything here as a quick examples, and now we're going to dig into video and photos. So if you look at video, we have this wonderful thing called the Office 365 Video Portal. And this is a great way to manage video assets. Now, one of the things I see some organizations do is they say, well, I don't want people to go to the video portal, and then they, they, they sometimes leave the internet in the internet, and that's okay. You say, no, 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 just like other things, like the Delve search experience, there's things we want people to move to this other place for. So it's okay for people to go to the video portal sometimes. We can use the embed, on the left-hand side you'll see an animation here, we can actually use the embed functionality to add the video assets to the internet, and we should be doing this, stop uploading videos, to document libraries, please. We should be using this because we can get the streaming benefits and it's better on mobile. Because remember, these are responsive design pages and so on and so forth. So we should be using that. But this is also a great example of the innovation again. So in the video portal, they added the ability to download. They added the ability to have video-specific statistics. They added the ability to have transcripts and so on and so forth. It's wonderful stuff uh, that they've added into Office 365 Video, and they'll continue to add. If you've heard of Microsoft Stream and some of the cool stuff that they're experimenting with there that they'll eventually bring in. So there's lots of improvements, and that's why we want to embrace it, just like many of the other uh, features and functionality uh, scenarios. So again, this saves us a lot of energy, saves us a lot of time, and it also is a great opportunity 
to make our intranets maybe a little bit more dynamic. Maybe our intranets historically have been just news, but we say, you know what, for video, maybe we try and create an intranet channel, or we try and create new channels, and we actually have people upload video, and then we surface them in a variety of news posts and things like that. Wouldn't that be exciting? And so you can actually change sort of new experiences. So with that, I think uh, we're doing pretty good time. We have five minutes for Q&A. Um, that's, that's my quick, you know, here's the stuff you should know about intranets in Office 365. Hopefully it gives you some ideas that how, there's a really interesting potential in Office 365. Um, there's evaluations. Please fill out your evaluations. Let me know what you would have liked to see, because then if I'm uh, lucky enough to be invited here next or in future events, I'll be able to improve the material. Um, it's 45 minutes, so it's a bit hard to jam a lot of technical stuff in there. Um, and then uh, with that, uh, I would love to, is there anyone who wants to come up? Please ask the question here, or I can repeat it if you want. Um, I'd just love to get some good questions on internet. Stuff that I didn't cover, you're like, oh, I wish you had talked about this. Uh, the comment is, um, I mentioned a lot of customizations. Now, what I'm trying to do, just be clear, is I'm saying these are the things that I, I would consider a common customization scenario, right? I'm not saying you have to. Everything I've described, you don't have to do, especially if you're an organization that you really want to embrace out of the box. It's just that for design reasons and for other reasons, you might want to. Um, really important is when I was describing these customizations, I'm talking about modern techniques and modern technologies. The good news is if you're building anything in Office 365, you're pretty much forced to use modern techniques, which is really good, client-side code, things like that. Um, and if you are using things like customizing master pages or doing other customizations that are, they run into issues down the road, then you're going to run into those issues. So there's a whole separate um, element to this, which is you know, what's the right uh, technical way to build these customizations. But I definitely want to be clear, uh, you know, we do want customizations. You know, if, if you think about the intranet experience, um, if you want an award-winning intranet, you want, a, you know, a, an intranet that's very compelling, um, sh the Microsoft team will not be up that value chain until a lot of other things are done. Right now, they're focused on the things that only they can do. Only Microsoft can really build these uh, wonderful team collaboration scenarios for news and things like that. And that makes sense, right? Because if we try and build it and deploy it, it's going to be, it's, that's, that's a great workload for them to prioritize and focus on versus these things that are much you know, more vertical or specialized, right? So they'll make their way up the value chain, and we should see improvements on intranets and I'm sure this conversation will be very different next year. But for now, um, I do think that there is a, a good gap and opportunity for customizations and third-party products. There's, um, there's a lot of vendors in the, the hall at this event, and I'm sure lots of vendors will probably respond on the video and stuff like that and say, we have, oh, we do this. Um, but the, the idea here is that there's um, other ways. If you don't want to build it, you can always buy it. Um, and so that's also an option that's available to you. Um, but that's an awesome, awesome point around customizations. Definitely reduce customizations, right? And I think Delve and other things helps with that because we can't customize some of these experiences. Another question? Still got a couple minutes. Yep. How do you make it so that you can get to the home page or get to your internet without identifying who you are? So the question is, how do I make it so that you can get to the internet homepage without identifying who you are? Um, so when a user um, accesses 365, they're authenticated in some way. Um, and so we know who they are. We know everything about them, right? We, anything that they've provided or anything that we've synced over. So I don't, um, I guess there's that element. If it's just getting to the internet in the first place, like uh, redirecting people to the internet or? It's like a, you're on a managed asset. I already know who you are. Oh, oh. Uh, to get to the portal without gotcha. The um, so the, the, sorry, the question reframed is uh, if, Right now, when I use Office 365, I have to authenticate. And so is there a way to do auto-authentication or something based on a managed device or another scenario like that? Um, the quick answer is the experience is improving in a variety of ways. Um, so there's definitely like a different caching scenarios and other things that are happening. Um, there's definitely scenarios like if you do uh, Azure AD Sync with ADFS, because remember, the authentication is happening uh, on, in your environment at that point. But at the end of the day, it is still cloud service. So my biggest caution here is, even if you could hack it and figure out ways to kind of auto-authenticate, realize that a lot of people are going to use this internet, hopefully, from other locations, from home, on the road, et cetera. And so you, you want to come up with a holistic solution. So you, you can't really remove it, but what the nice thing is, is they've done such a good job with Azure Active Directory and even Azure Directory Premium, where um, you have this really nice single sign-on. So when I sign on to today into any of these Office 
experiences. From Word Online to you know, SharePoint to Yammer, et cetera, it authenticates me across. So I'm never re-logging in, if you will. And I think that that's a huge uh, gain for us. Um, and it simplifies things. And remember that the credentials are the same too. So if I have on-prem and I have my user account that I'm signing into my machine, I can actually make those the same credentials that I'm doing online, again, based on how we set up the federation for identity or how we sync the identity. Um, and so that experience is definitely improving. But uh, until we get to the point where we can have kind of like the Windows Hello style thing where you know maybe I just go to the web page and it actually detects and you've said it's okay for it to see your, your picture and do all that kind of authentication, I think we're a ways away from not asking basically people once to, to authenticate for cloud-based properties like this. Um, that was probably a longer <laughs> response than you guys were looking for. One more question, maybe? Yeah? Yeah, so the, this is a great, this is a great point. So uh, the point that's made is, hey, we're not using like the E-suite licensing. So Office 365 Video, the thing that I was showing at the end there, that Office 365 Video is only available for customers with E1 and above, right? Because it's kind of, it's a suite-based uh, solution. Um, Microsoft has built Microsoft Stream to help with that. So one of the reasons Stream is a separate price point is that I might want to buy Microsoft Stream for users without necessarily having to deal with that the same model. You can also consider that maybe Office 365 Video is only really for this collection of users, right? And so that you can kind of dynamically work through that. But maybe if you, yeah, yeah if you, I guess if you have a lot of kiosk users, it, it's stream, and then outside of even that, you might, for that very specialized scenario for licensing, you might not use the video portal for all uh, video assets, for communication-based video assets, maybe you would use some other technique. Um, and then for knowledge management and all the other stuff, you'd totally use this because most users that would probably consume those videos would actually have rights to it. So you can kind of do a mixture for sure, um, since it's free with E1 and above. But if you have a lot of, really it's I think the deskless worker, if you have a lot of those scenarios or for whatever reason not everyone's licensed on Office 365 and that's a strategy that you have, then that's where Stream really kind of comes in as, a, as an alternative. And again, those will be combined, Stream and video this in my morning session, but those will be combined. It's just, um, in, for now, it's a, a new licensing option, and so they have a slightly different experience. Different controls, to keep that in mind. All right, uh, and one more question, and then I think I've got to wrap it up. Um, what are the best practices on uh, ownership and governance of internet? What are the, this is like, I should pay you. Uh, what, are the, <laughs> what are the best practices for ownership uh, and governance and things like that for intranets? Um, uh, have it. Um, yeah, uh, so, so uh, yes, right? So uh, this, is, this is totally dependent on your organization. I, I would say, first of all, um, understand that there's different types of governance. There's technology governance and the technical pieces. There's the uh, communication uh, governance and how we're gonna govern the content uh, and things like that. So definitely think through governance. I like teams. Uh, you can use committee if you want, whatever the phrase that works for your organization, but you definitely want to think through it. Have, uh, if you have meetings around governance, that first step. Um, I don't really focus on policies and guidance and templates, but uh, I will tell you there's a resource. So in office365resources.com, one of the resources is this questionnaire, and it's, it's called the Success Readiness Questionnaire for Office 365, and in it we have uh, 30 plus questions that ask you, do you have this policy? Do you have this document? And the point here is not that you should go create all these documents. The point here is it creates the conversation internally, why don't we? Should we have that? And then you're having that internal conversation. So my biggest thing is governance conversations should be happening. I don't, I don't, I mean, certainly we want it to be, you know, fluid and moving uh, forward on a continual basis. If you need something to kick it off and you really need that quick starting guidance um, of what you're missing, what are those gaps, start with that success questionnaire, do it, and then uh, either reach out to somebody else who knows it, reach out to us, or just do it yourself and look at what are all those gaps that remain and which ones do we need to do in the next three months, which ones do we need to do you know, in the future, et cetera. And there's questions in there about like building your own center of excellence and how does that, you know, what's the state of your center of excellence. Even has role questions, so like do I have, so it's an excuse, but I, it's like 30 plus pages, uh, it's intense, of questions that you can ask around all these non-technical things and I think that that's probably my, both an opportunity to plug and also I think an opportunity to hopefully help you guys um, and if it's not good enough, let me know and we'll work on actually you know, making a web version of it or doing something else uh, whenever we can get some sleep in time. With that, thank you guys. Uh, enjoy, enjoy the weekend and thanks for coming to Ignite. <laughs>